For those of you who are joining us, thank you very much. Um, we look forward to having a robust discussion on a very important topic this morning. We'll introduce our guests momentarily. We are here to, uh, today to talk about, have a discussion about um, a crucial topic for those who are concerned about climate change. And truly, that really must mean all of us um, who are residents of the planet Earth. Um, Short-lived climate pollutants is really a haul together different category of climate change forcing chemicals in our atmosphere. And as it turns out, we, as you will hear, rival the importance and power um, of, of, um, of carbon. And so we're trying to lift that discussion up so that people appreciate um, the uh, significance of these, um, of these discussions and of this topic. So uh, we have with us, I think today, uh, some of the most important speakers on this topic, Dr. Ramanathan, who's the chair of sustainability Presidential Chair in Climate Sustainability at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. We have Dave Doniger, who's been at NRDC for not, since 1978, and he's their Strategic Director of Climate and Clean Energy. We have Jason Anderson, Director of Governance, Diplomacy, Superpollutants, Super Climate Works, and Climate Works. Dr. Alyssa Ako at um, Environmental Defense Fund, where she's the climate scientist. Colby Sky from the LA Department of Public Works. And Dr. Ryan McCarthy, who uh, for many for years was Mary, uh, Mary Nichols' uh, chief technology and science advisor at the Air Resources Board, uh, some of the really leading voices on this topic. Um, I want to uh, get our discussion going. I think this morning by a little bit of setup here. Um, I first uh, began to delve really deeply, I think, into climate on the election of 2016. Um, that evening when President Trump was elected, my son um, was apoplectic. Um, he was apoplectic because he thought for sure with that, with that election, we were gonna get so far behind in our climate efforts that we would be uh, unable to recover. So I began to deep dive into it. And oh, by the way, let me also introduce Gerilyn Mendoza, I'm sorry, Gerilyn. The people you know the best and the longest sometimes get, get introduced last. Gerilyn Mendoza is a regional organizer for the Climate Center, and she and I have worked together for, I don't know, a dozen years. So my apologies, Gerilyn. All right, so uh, in 2016, um, um, stimulated by my son's uh, worry that um, a new president might knock the effort to bait climate change off of its axis, I began to uh, get into the issue myself and try to investigate ways in which I could contribute, ways in which Move LA could contribute uh, to this discussion. Um, you all should know that we are pondering with others a possible ballot measure in the state of California to raise a boatload of money, uh, probably $3 billion a year over 30 years, invest and strategies to abate climate change. And one of those very, very important strategies you'll hear about today, um, it's um, the problem of short-lived climate pollutants. And as I was about to tell you, I had no idea that there was even a problem of short-lived climate pollutants in 2016. And now I am worried that there are many others out there who attentive, generally speaking, who also are unaware of the importance of this challenge and how it really is a co-equal challenge with carbon reductions. And so we were motivated to bring forward um, and introduce the speakers we have with us today because of their stature in this discussion, the leadership that they have all displayed in helping the public really um, understand fully this challenge. So we might invest our efforts and our funding uh, into reductions of short-lived climate pollutants. Now, I'm not gonna get into uh, the specifics of each pollutant. There are several, um, I, I think our speakers will. And I wanna first start by introducing to you uh, Dr. Ramanathan. Um, 
Let's try to get Dr. Ramanathan up here on the screen. And Dr. Ramanathan was one of the first, maybe the first scientist to really um, raise up the issue of short-lived climate pollutants back in 1975. Um, and there was a big article in the New York Times about it. And um, he thought then, I think uh, he'll, he'll test that that meant that we were going to get out in front on this issue in a timely way. I think um, that is not exactly what has happened. So Dr. Monathan, are you here? Yes. Hi, Dr. Monathan. Listen, thank you so much for your time and all the time you give um, to this effort um, around the world. Um, congratulations on multiple awards for your leadership. The next time you uh, give advice to the Pope, um, please uh, say hello for all of us and tell him that we are happy to share this world with him and happy that he's um, active in the efforts to fight climate change. So, Dr. Monathan, um, um, I have heard super pollutants, and I'm going to pass the floor to you here soon. I have heard these super pollutants described as our biggest risk also perhaps our biggest opportunity, our best way out of uh, climate change, that if we attend to it um, you know, in, a, in a direct and immediate fashion, we can really make a big difference on, on addressing the issue of climate in our communities. Um, so uh, what, what do you say in response to that characterization? Thank you. Uh... And, and first, thanks to Move LA and your institution for organizing this. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. All right, I'm gonna share my screen and let me see if it works. <clears throat> oh, sorry. We got it, I think. I'm not able to show the full PowerPoint mode. Uh, yeah, okay, now I got it. Yeah. Okay, uh, so let me uh, go to the uh, first slide. There is uh, a very little, uh, very few, even those working in the field recognize this. There is an, a new emergency which has hit the planet. And, and that's where uh, this, we need the super pollutants to come to our rescue. Uh, this was a paper we published uh, uh, three years ago. And what we showed was that this uh, much feared degree and a half warming, IPCC was projecting that will happen in 2040s. But our analysis showed that one and a half degree warming would be crossed by year 2030, uh, 2030 just in nine years from now. And <clears throat> why is that such a big deal? I think most agree that the degree and a half is when, when we cross it, we'll push the planet into so-called dangerous warming. And my own uh, projection is that when we hit the one and a half degree warming, there is at least a 70% probability we'll hit it. Uh, is that COVID, uh, climate change like COVID will move into our living rooms uh, within 10 years. And I fully expect massive public demand for climate solutions. But right now we don't have the support we need for the sort of drastic actions. Uh, this meeting is about California. Why should Californians worry about this? And so let me touch on that. So we asked the question, what levers do we have for bending the warming curve rapidly? Is there any chance we can delay that one and a half degree warming? Uh, in my work, I think many would agree with this, that the only lever we have, we don't have levers, we have only one lever. And that is the short-lived climate pollutants. Uh, there are four of them. Uh, we are targeting methane, which is, uh, it comes in natural gas, black carbon soot, the dark stuff you see coming out of diesel vehicles, 
ozone, we don't see them, but we inhale them and it causes asthma and it's a dangerous air pollutant, but it's also a powerful greenhouse gas. Then HFC is used as refrigerants. The power behind this is that we have the technologies and we know how to cut them down. And California is one of the world leaders in this. So if we use the available technologies and all the nations in the world, hopefully California would lead this, we can cut the rate of warming by half by 2040. What does that mean? We can delay the degree and a half warming by about 50 years, push it past 2045. And, and doing that, we also improve the air California brief and we improve our agriculture productivity tremendously by cutting down the ozone. So there are global benefits and local benefits. And this is about creating a bond issue or whatever for California. So why should California, Californians care? This is a hotspot bulletin for California we released two months ago based on our two years of work. And if you just see the top four graphs on your right-hand side, you know, it's just too small for you to read. California is already warmed by three degrees Fahrenheit. And what's called vapor pressure deficit, that is linked directly to fires. And that has increased by 20%. In other words, water is evaporating rapidly from our soils, from our trees, from our skin, from everything. And scientists have shown the wet season in the fall has been delayed by about 27 days and the rainfall has come down by 25%. All of that has acted at a trigger point amplifier of California's fires and that's shown in the last slide. And what it shows in the last 10 years, California about 11 acres were burning. That's almost one third of our forest area. I don't know why no one is uh, creating a huge motion of this. A third of our forests are burning. And let's come to Southern California. That's where we are. And I'm showing here the precipitation change from uh, the last 40 years. <clears throat> And you see Southern California in the rapid drying trend. Our rainfall has decreased tremendously. And the problem is Southern California depends on water from the North, but the North is in a severe deficit. And it also depends on the Colorado River. The runoff from the Colorado River has already decreased by 20%. So it's not clear to me how we are going to deal with this water issue. This is all from one degree warming. Imagine if the warming amplifies by another 50%. I forgot to mention to you just about three, two months ago, uh, the UN uh, announced the warming has gone from one degree to 1.2. It's already halfway up there, okay? So that's, so we have a local interest to protect ourselves from the super pollutants. I want to just uh, conclude with what are the low hanging fruits in terms of this uh, uh, shortly climate pollutants, super pollutants. They're, they're called by multiple names. The first one, remember I said black carbon, the black carbon soot. I think we should, we can shoot for a uh, soot free California, basically make the diesel soot free and convert our, all our fossil fuels to electric vehicles. All the way starting from our lawnmowers, they're uh, another you know, a local source of huge soot. The second, food waste. I don't know if, how many of you know, agriculture is a major source of carbon emissions, CO2 emissions. And we Americans throw 40% of the food into our garbage. At all places, at homes, at restaurants, you know, companies, etc. There's no reason why we can't make that food waste free. First, we ban discarding food and organic waste in garbage. That way, we avoid all the uh, carbon emissions from garbage trucks, and then uh, the so-called respectable food we serve them to uh, uh, you know uh, uh, to communities. 
And the third, what we can't, instead of throwing in the garbage, we have community level biodigesters to convert that into uh, so-called biogas. Certainly, you know, we are a big source of fracking. We have to ban the leaks of methane from fracking and gas pipes, you know, just by better maintenance. And from farm areas, repurpose that farm manure and crop waste into biogas, okay? Of course, our biggest source of soot is forest because of burning, there's, you know, uh, the only way we can help that is by cutting down the warming rapidly, bending the warming curve, but also management of forests. Last but not least, uh, HFCs, a ton of HFCs leaking from your refrigerant contributes to contribute a warming equivalent to 2000 tons of CO2. We don't have to use HFC, there are alternate refrigerant. There is also already a protocol. Uh, the Montreal protocol has been amended by the Kigali amendment, by, you know, led by Americans during Obama administration. And so, but we have to speed up the phase of the HFC by 2030. Uh, in conclusion, uh, Danny, I, I wanted to th uh, thank you and Gloria and others who have organized this. Uh, this is just the best thing uh, NGOs like you can do to bend down that warming curve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramanathan, for your leadership and your participation. I, I have a couple of questions. Um, um, so, when we think here of black carbon particulate matter, mm -hmm. um, and we think of ozone, these are two of the powerful short-lived climate pollutants, but they are also two of our most uh, consequential air pollutants that affect our health each day. Not just the warming of the climate, but you know, especially people who live along freeways, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Diesel technologies are a primary source of both black carbon and ozone. Ozone by way of the NOx that comes out of the, the diesel engines. So if we, are, if we were to accelerate our strategies to move um, diesel technologies out of our lives, <laughs> entirely out of our economy, and replace them with electricity where that works, perhaps with hydrogen where that works, et cetera. If we were able to do that on an accelerated basis, wouldn't that make a big difference uh, for both ozone and black carbon? Absolutely, uh, Derry. I mean, uh, <clears throat> just a fantastic question. To me, it is sad. <clears throat> this is something we estimated in a study three years ago. Even now, 250,000 Americans die every year from air pollution. In California, it's tens of thousands. All of that is avoidable, okay? And so the first step we have to take is to make, make our transportation diesel free. And, and, and the steps you uh, laid is the best and it's gonna have a local effect, it's gonna have a regional effect. And, uh, and, the, and, and the same thing with ozone, ozone in, you know, in children, it causes similar lung restrictions and has asthma. And uh, the other thing I want to point out in all of this is that <clears throat> if just California reduced its emissions, it's not going to help the slow down the global warming. We have to persuade the rest of the nation and the world. So there we develop technologies and show the world how to get rid of diesel emissions. It would be a powerful message to the whole world. So you know, we need to act as a living laboratory. So those are the things I had in my mind when I listed my five low hanging fruits. If you saw diesel was on the top of my list. Thank you. So, so in the measure that we are thinking about either for 2022 or 2024, um, I think um, there would be a very significant share of the resources, maybe a, a billion and a half dollars a year, that could be invested in incentives for clean truck um, and off-road equipment, um, construction equipment, and marine, clean marine vessel, vessels, et cetera. Um, 
in addition, California has adopted an advanced clean truck rule um, uh, requiring manufacturers to accelerate zero emission trucks mm -hmm. in their fleets. But they're about also to adopt a advanced clean fleet rule requiring larger fleets to buy these technologies. So it seems to me that if we had that trifecta of the regulations on manufacturing, regulation on major fleets, and then money for incentives and to help build infrastructure, we could really accelerate in the next decade, for example, a dramatic transformation. What do you think? Uh I want to just uh, correct you on one aspect. I agree with okay. everything except the decade. I would like to see this done on a even five-year time scale uh -huh. because the whole world has to do this in 10, 15 years. So if we can accelerate ours and then take the technology to the rest of the nation and the world. So I would even like to put it on a faster track if possible. Well, it's, that might be possible, in fact. Um, and of course, virtually every manufacturer of, of these technologies markets their technologies in California. Yep. So what we do as a result of being the fifth largest economy, tell me if you think I'm wrong, can really have an outsized effect of making this possible to accelerate worldwide. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's really why we're here today, is mm -hmm. to is to help light a fire. Um, we wanna share this program with legislative leaders and foundation leaders and community leaders all over so that they will get it as well. And so I wanna thank you for your leadership and your participation. Thank you, Daddy. And I know you got dozens of things to do today. So thank you very much. Yeah, bye. Okay, so uh, we're gonna move now to uh, David Doniger um, and uh, David, uh, actually, he doesn't know this, but I've been a fan of his for quite a long time, um, his work at NRDC. I worked with NRDC in the early 90s when I was the director of the Coalition for Clean Air. NRDC and then um, the Coalition for Clean Air collaborated to create a California truck working group, led to the creation of the Carl Moyer program. Now, Jason, Carl Moyer program, working on that is where I met your former boss, Charlotte Para. We worked together on this. So this is a, um, you know, a really, I think, a, a growing up of leaders that we're seeing before us uh, in their leadership role. And Dave, um, thank you very much for all your leadership. And you're especially well known and regarded for your le leadership internationally, um, helping to reduce HFCs. So I'm going to ask you to tell our audience more about HFC is what the hell is that? And how dangerous is it? How are we doing? Is there a way out of this? Thank you very much. Uh, and let's see if I can share my screen. <clears throat> uh oh, is anything showing? Yes, looks good. Okay, good. Well, um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to talk with you about it this important topic, and I'm gonna focus in on the HFCs. <clears throat> Just to put it in context, we've been at this for nearly 50 years, starting with the CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, which um, Dr. Amanoffin and Drs. Roland and Molina, others discovered were a threat to the ozone layer back in the early 70s, and also to the climate, as I will describe. So I know DC played a, a key role in um, helping to ban aerosols in the 70s. And then uh, during the 80s, suing EPA, proposing a global CFC phase out and um, quite surprisingly getting the Reagan administration to back that idea and push for such a treaty internationally. So in 1987, there was agreement on something called the Montreal Protocol, which is a treaty now that has um, universal global participation, every country on earth, to phase out CFCs and dozens of other chemicals that hurt the ozone layer. Uh, as you can, as I will explain, it also has major climate benefits and implications 
Um, and we also work to get national legislation, the CFC phase out, uh, adopted in the 1990 Clean Air Act amendment. Um, getting rid of CFCs, which I'm gonna explain are still actually around in many old buildings and equipment. Uh, uh, but it, it has produced, is producing a huge public benefit, saving uh, literally tens of millions of people around the world from skin cancer, cataracts, other diseases due to ozone depletion. There are also powerful greenhouse gases, super uh, powerful, even, even I call them the super duper pollutants because now we're on, onto the super pollutants of the HFCs. The CFCs, some of them had 10,000 times the heat trapping pump, punch pound for pound of carbon dioxide. There's obviously not as many pounds, but they're an important chunk of the climate change problem. And getting rid of the CFCs worldwide, which we have done uh, in terms of new production uh, uh, of those chemicals, has pushed David, back. If I could say just one thing, um, we've done that. I mean, that, to me, what's important about that is not only that CFCs are a, 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 a climate pollutant, but it demonstrates that we can get something yeah. big done in a exactly. timely way. And through a stacked up process of, uh, of state, federal, and uh, international action, which I will um, get to. So the point I want to make here is the magnitude of the CFC phase zone is incredible in that it would have been this hot and this fiery and this stormy 10 years ago if we hadn't done that. Uh, so, uh, and it would be that much worse now. So, uh, but we didn't, um, the job isn't done. The HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons, are some of the CFC replacements. Some of the CFCs got replaced by a whole bunch of things, but HFCs are our principal refrigerant um, uh, replacement. They're also powerful, not so much as, H as CFCs. So moving to HFCs was a temporary step in the right direction, but 4,000 times the potency of CO2 is, as Dr. Ramanathan has explained, far more than we can <clears throat> live with now. And uh, based on uh, a proposal from NRDC, the Obama administration worked for about 10 years on the, what became the Kigali Agreement, uh, agreed in Kigali, Rwanda in 2016, to use the Montreal Protocol to phase down the HFCs in the same way as the CFCs were eliminated. So um, uh, why do we need to do this? It's been projected that if we didn't do it, if the HFCs grew the way they were, added, we'd have another half degree centigrade of warming, which pretty much, you know, eliminated any, would eliminate any possibility of meeting the Paris objective of holding total warming under one and a half degrees. So I have to do this. And um, the, uh, uh, here in the United States, um, uh, uh, we worked with an industry coalition to get enacted bipartisan legislation uh, at the end of last year um, in the big omnibus bill, the American Innovation and Manufacturing Act, which was its title in order to disguise its purpose for uh, uh, the benefit of Republicans, was adopted on a bipartisan basis. It calls for a global phase down of the uh, HFCs on roughly this time, uh, time scale. There's slightly different time frames for developed and developing countries. Um, uh, it, 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 so the bill enacts that reduction schedule in the US. It also authorizes a great deal more at the federal level to switch um, uh, the prominent end uses, particularly refrigeration and air conditioning to lower impact alternatives as fast as you can and to set up rules for leak detection and prevention and to require the reclaim and the reuse and the destruction of old refrigerant. Uh, and that is what I wanna focus on because that is where there's a real opportunity for uh, state and local action that um, can help accelerate things. Because, um, uh, well, first of all, I wanna note 
that California and some 14 other states acted during the Trump administration while we were trying to get this federal legislation to keep things on the rails and to keep the Kigali uh, commitments that industry had made in place. So a lot of credit to California for uh, building up a program that deals with um, transitions for air conditioning, uh, curbing leakage and transitioning supermarkets, which are a big source of leakage. And uh, we hope in the future promoting the reclaim and, the, and, and reuse, which eliminates the need for new refrigerant. So there's still a lot to do. And, and this is where I, I want to focus the rest of my talk. So there's thousands of tons of refrigerant in equipment, in buildings, and to some extent in vehicles, uh, of, of air conditioning and refrigeration equipment that has not only HFCs in it, but even CFCs still. Uh, and the, the, this material eventually leaks out. In the case of supermarkets, they can lose a 10% to a quarter of their refrigerant every year because they're in inherently leaky systems. And we really need to tighten that up and get those off of HFCs as soon as possible. In the case of uh, buildings, um, I want to give you this case study that um, was performed in Chicago by a an architecture and engineering firm called ESD Global. I think that stands for environmentally sustainable. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot exactly what it stands for. But uh, I'm borrowing from the presentation given at a, a webinar there a couple of weeks ago. And, and this firm did a study just of um, big buildings in the Chicago Loop area, which were built in uh, that period, 85 to 95, uh, 80 to 95. Many of them were built with CFC 11 um, uh, you know, uh, uh, refrigerants in their chillers. The chillers operate for a very long time, but these buildings are coming due for major rehab and, and update. This must be true in LA as well. A whole generation of, of buildings uh, built in, in that time period. So they did a, an analysis of 100 properties with 93,000 tons of refrigeration. They estimate that by removing the CFC 11, you could eliminate more than 250,000 uh, tons of CO2 equivalent. You replace it with not 54,000. Uh, you replace it with 54 metric tons, not, not 108,000, 108 metric tons of CO2 equivalent from the new refrigerant. That's a reduction of almost 90, well, more than 99.9% .9 in terms of the global warming impact of the refrigerants uh, if they're uh, released and it's equivalent to taking 55,000 cars off the road every year. So this is an example. Now this can be done uh, with the benefit of incentives for energy efficiency that uh, I, I know exists through the utilities and under uh, the California, I'm not as familiar with California rules as I might be, but I, I know that these kinds of incentives exist and maybe there's room for additional incentives specifically targeted at the refrigerants. Um, but there's a huge opportunity for uh, avoiding these refrigerants ever getting into the atmosphere, reusing them or destroying them, and um, also getting energy efficiency upgrades uh, into the bargain. So uh, that's what I really wanted to lay out there is I would love to see similar kinds of analysis of the building stock in LA or San Francisco and other places in California. Um, and I bet this firm in Chicago would be interested in helping do that, but that's beyond the scope of, uh, of what I can do. Uh, so just, just to be clear, Dave, um, you, you believe the Kigali Agreement in particular and the related American and other national adoptions of implementing measures will deal with the problem of newly created refrigerants. Um, and that our yeah. big problem is what do we do? It's like a recycling problem. You know, how do we get the HFCs that are already out in the marketplace and older equipment, how do we get that recovered and 
captured so it can't go in the atmosphere. Yes, that's the opportunity. Uh, that sounds very doable, right? I mean, it's just that sounds like uh, not a no brainer, but hey, some resources and we can do that. Yeah, and the the opportunity is to combine thinking about energy efficiency and the direct impact of these refrigerants when they get loose at the same time to make it a business proposition for building owners or supermarket owners to well, how big an through. impact. I'm sorry, how big an impact do these HFCs have on the on climate if they if they run loose and wild? Yeah, so uh, I don't know the exact number to put on it. I, as I mentioned, if we had let the production and use and leakage of these chemicals go on growing like it was worldwide, you could add another half degree uh, centigrade to the to the total burden. Now, what we're talking about here, is you know slices of that um but this is a problem where there is no silver bullet there's lots of silver buckshot and uh we have to do any number of these things especially if you can put measures to curb the refrigerant leakage together with energy efficiency improvements in this building stock uh you've got a really positive proposition economically as well as for the environment. Cool. David, listen, thank you very much for joining us today and bringing your expertise. I look forward someday to actually meeting you uh, rather than simply virtually. Um, thank you and, very much for including me. And I would like you to say, uh, uh, you know, hello to my good friends at NRDC, to Joel Reynolds, if you see him. Hi, Joel, if you're watching, and uh, <laughs> David Pettit, and a few others that have long been. I would like to see these guys again someday too. I'm I'm back in Washington, and, we've been, and like everyone else, we're living in a virtual world. Very good. Thank you so I much. Usually have a background from Mars here, but I use mine. I know you have another meeting to go to, so I want to thank you for taking your time to be with us. Thank you very much. We'll keep you apprised of our progress. Very good. So now I'm going to introduce to you Jason Anderson, um, who is the Director of Governance and Diplomacy about Super Pollutants um, at Climate Works, which is both a foundation, I guess, and an active advocacy organization um, and located in the Bay Area of California. Um, he works, Jason works internationally as well. Um, and I've asked him, he's got an overview that he wants to present and I think that's appropriate. If there's some redundancy in what you hear today, folks in our audience, understand that part of what we're trying to do is emphasize the key role each of these different pollutants have um, in our climate change and how it is we really must tackle all of them, not just zero emission you know, trucks and cars are not enough, We've got other challenges, and that's why I think we need to uh, be a little bit redundant for emphasis so that people walk away with a clear appreciation of how important, but also how doable this challenge is. And I've asked uh, Jason to spend a little extra time on black carbon, if he could, uh, which Dr. Romanathan also discussed, um, maybe wildfire portion of that especially. So uh, Jason, how are you doing, man? I'm doing very well, and 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 it's really an honor to be able to speak after the likes of Dr. Ramanathan and and Dave Doniger, who are absolute leaders in this area. So it's a real pleasure to be with you. Yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen, and I'll get uh, my presentation up. Um, Climate Works Foundation, as as you mentioned, based in San Francisco, and we work globally, primarily outside of, of the United States, but we've done a significant amount of work uh, also in the USA and California. We are making the argument that it's time to take FAST action. Now, FAST is actually an acronym that we use, FAST Action on Super Pollutants today. And we've been working very closely with our par partners in the Pisces Foundation and uh, among grantees uh, to to finally get through to people about how important this is. And you've already had that on the panel emphasizing that. I started working on HFCs in 1999 
um, on the climate aspects. And at that point, it was already more than a decade old among the people who had been working on the Montreal Protocol from the 80s. So it's not like it's new, but it's still something that hasn't quite soaked through to people what the impact of our action on these pollutants can be. So this is what we say about why everybody should care about them. About half, almost half of the global warming to date has been because of super pollutants and not uh, because of carbon dioxide. And when we are looking at trying to reduce warming and the impacts of these pollutants in the coming three decades, we hear so much about 2050 goals, super pollutant controls together with CO2 will yield seven times more cooling benefit than only working on CO2. That's because they have wow. these short, short residence times and you can have a, an immediate impact when you address them. Unlike with, with CO2, which has this, this time delay before you feel the benefit, even though we absolutely have to do that. So for years, there was always this question of, do we do one or do we the other? No, you do them both, but um, you make sure that you uh, don't overlook the super pollutants. Now, in, implementing these technologies means that, of course, we're avoiding uh, the impacts of climate like sea level rise but also the air pollution that has already been mentioned, this, these, this soot, these particulates, also methane and ozone. There is millions of deaths that are attributed to these pollutants uh, globally. And there are direct impacts on crop losses as well, which of course in many places in the world is a, is a particularly important concern for, for daily life and livelihood. We also see this as an opportunity in the climate space where there is so much emphasis on global agreements and models and, and, and big ideas about what we're going to do with carbon dioxide. Actually, when you talk to people, it's classically thought of in terms of development priorities in developing countries, but it's equally true in communities right around California and the United States as well, that people are, are very motivated by air pollution, by the impact on human health, and they understand that because we're fighting that in our daily lives. So there's a real close connection to that that increases the political viability of working on super pollutants. Also, the types of things that we're talking about doing, honestly, they're, they're not rocket science for the most part. There's a lot of off-the-shelf technologies, whether you're trying to reduce methane leakage from the oil and gas industry, where we're talking about gaskets and turning valves for the most part, uh, or air conditioning technicians and the kind of careful renovation that David just described as well. All of these are in industries where there's a lot of job creation opportunities. And we're often talking about pollutants in areas that have equity implications of addressing these pollutants. And that's very important for our communities. This is a, a graphic that I like to show because I was able, uh, unfortunately, but very handily to make the analogy to COVID last year, which is that we need to flatten the curve on super pollutants which is to say that one of the, one of the uh, characteristics of our community, broadly speaking, people who work on, on climate change is that we'll often have these long-term models with these very nicely cur curved graphics that yield some kind of climate stabilization in the, in the second half of the century or net zero by 2050. But if we're always talking about endpoints, we're not talking about what's happening along the way. And you can see that the red curve and the green curve have roughly end up in the same place with respect to temperature rise. But with the red curve, you're not addressing super pollutants early. You're waiting until later. And the implication of that is that you have more warming, you have more air pollution, and you have millions of lives lost due to that delay. So this is a direct analogy to what we were, what was on everybody's lips last year. We need to address now, flatten that curve, slow that growth down, and save lives. The other thing that we often hear from our community is, well, we're, we're going to a fully renewable, fully electrified world. Um, so, you know, why are you talking about these interim steps? The fact of the matter is, is yes, we need to fully transition to electric vehicles and as many modes of transport as we can. But along the way, we are going to have people dying from diesel pollution. So we need to filter it. And we also need to phase it out in steps everywhere we can across the board. It's not just a technology solution electrification, it's also an implementation issue. As we're fill, uh, phasing out fossil fuels as an energy source, we still need to stop the leakage inventing of methane. 
And by the way, once we've gotten off of even natural gas as an energy source, it's a fantastic chemical, which you, you can use for all kinds of things. So there's still gonna be exploding natural gas and it's still going to be leaking. So we still need to have a methane strategy. And we often hear about the success of the Montreal Protocol and the Kigali Amendment that, that David mentioned, and that's fantastic. But implementing it is a whole other ballgame. And so we need to make sure that we are addressing that implementation challenge in detail. So we look at three main areas. One of them is to reduce methane. This is where we're going to get our biggest bang for the buck from the climate perspective. Now, there's been a lot of work that's been done on the natural gas industry. As I say, it's not complicated to do. It's just complicated to get the industry to do it. But we have less advance in areas around agriculture. So you can see that actually more than half of the methane emissions in California come from dairies and uh, livestock. And there are techniques to deal with it, but they're not as commercialized. They're not as well known. This happens to be a little filter that Cargill is, is uh, planning to, to roll out, which goes over the nose of a cow and captures all of the, uh, the famous cow burps and, and uh, neutralizes the methane. We also, as I see, need, need to phase out diesel. Um, and that's not just from cars, it's significantly from trucks, from ships, from off-road equipment. I run our campaign on ships. And ships are an incredibly dangerous source of particulates of black carbon because they use a fuel out at sea that is orders of magnitude more polluting than even what you'll put uh, into, a, into a truck. And um, when, these, when these ships are idling at port or when they're charging up to go out, that's a real problem. So we need to look at more than just, uh, more than just cars and trucks. And uh, again, just echoing what David said, that we need to accelerate F-gas phase out. Things like super, uh, supermarkets. Now, fluorocarbons are in all kinds of equipment, including unitary equipment like refrigerators and air conditioners, but they tend to be fairly well sealed. Whereas uh, supermarkets are big, they have pipes running all through them that is leaking all the time. And so we need to be able to have a program and fortunately California is in a leading position to be able to do this to address supermarkets. The net effect of all of this is that we could save an additional 0.6 degrees of warming. Now that is an wow. absolutely huge amount of warming. This uh, shows you that 0.1 degrees which, uh, with an aggressive carbon dioxide uh, approach, 0.6 degrees in addition from super pollutants. That's why we say doing them together is seven times as much as carbon dioxide alone. Now, looking at it from the philanthropic point of view, we've done an analysis of where there's already work underway, which, which is funded out in the community, the green areas. And we've made a dent in fossil fuels or buildings like HFCs uh, uh, and also things like bricks, uh, which, which emit a lot of uh, the manufacture of which emit a lot of black carbon. We're not nearly as far along in food and agriculture. Not to say that nothing is being done, but there's a huge opportunity here. And again, um, we think that Although there's a huge amount of impact we can have from super pollutants, only about 3% of philanthropic funding goes to working on, on super pollutants. So that's where we see a mismatch, which is then reflected also in, uh, in government policies in, in many places as well. So that's uh, the partners we're working on around the world, with around the world are trying to change that by raising the awareness of the importance of these substances. So, so Jason, that's it. thanks. I got some questions. I'm particularly it. interested in this interim uh, challenge that you mentioned. Um, uh, it looks like we heard earlier from Dr. Ramanathan that um, with respect to black carbon, you know, diesel trucks were a big, big part of the problem and that we want to accelerate uh, the end of diesel technologies being used in our communities because they're strong pollutants, but now we know they're big climate producers, right? So, um, but uh, one of the big challenges there is the long haul trucking sector. And we know in California that those long haul trucks might be about one eighth of all the trucks, that they're about half of our air pollution. They are oversized in their impact on, on uh, NOx, ozone and particulate matter in California. So. Along comes the strategy for electric trucks. Most people think, and I certainly agree, that 
we can electrify the trucking industry in the basin in California, where trucks that operate locally um, can easily go back and get charged overnight and so on. What do we do about the long haul trucking problem? Can we expect that battery technology is going to really be competitive with diesel technology operationally um, and you know simply replace diesel, all that diesel there, or do we also need to have strategies for things like hydrogen and maybe RNG, renewable natural gas from landfills, et cetera? What do you think about that, during, especially during that 10 year period? There's a gradient, but um, the, the thing about batteries is that they have progressed so much more quickly than anybody expected. When, when we talked about, it was, it was just not even on the radar that we would be having heavy trucks able to be electrified. And our position is that we need to aim for electrification of these trucks, including long haul trucks, because we think we can get there. The pace at which the cost is going down, the energy density and, and, and availability is going up uh, for trucks. Uh, work done here in, in California, Lawrence Brickley Lab, for example, is just showing that um, we should not underestimate how quickly we can move on, uh, on electrification. The, the problem with something like um, any alternatives that uh, require extensive infrastructure is it slows down that change. It's not easy to go to something like hydrogen or renewable natural gas. Also, it allows the opportunity for something like natural gas where the industry is extremely adept at making their bridge to the future being an, an endless bridge, essentially. Um, the only caveats to this are that, for example, deep sea ships uh, need a kind of uh, fuel. They, they, you can't electrify a ship that has a, a month's autonomy a, a, in, this, in the seas, at least for now. Um, so, and there can be cases in which off-road equipment with certain duty cycles might want to use hydrogen with, with fuel cells, for example. Um, but we don't, we think we're at the point where we have the optimism to, to talk about electrification of trucks. And it's my colleague, Anthony Eggert and his team that are working on that at Climateworks. Very, very good. Thank you so much, Jason. We'll call Anthony Eggert and have a, have a conversation with him because that's an area of real interest for us, especially if we're able to move forward with a ballot measure to try to accelerate technological um, introduction of clean technologies. But now we're gonna move to Dr. Alyssa Akko from EDF. Dr. Akko. Hi everyone. Yeah, thanks so much um, for having me today. And just before I get into my presentation, just a quick note on hydrogen, something that a lot of people don't realize is that it also is a super pollutant. It's a short lived climate pollutant that can trap a lot of heat. It doesn't do it directly. So that's one of the reasons why it's not on people's radar because hydrogen itself, if it leaks into the atmosphere from hydrogen applications and it's a very small molecule, so it can leak quite efficiently then it can trigger chemical reactions in the atmosphere that lead to warming in the short term. So it's just something to also keep in mind when we're thinking about alternatives to um, the fuels we use today. And it's just something that um, is another reason why electrification is so important and valuable. So with that, I will turn to my presentation um, let me share my slides. And so I'm going to focus today on methane. And so I come from the Environmental Defense Fund. I've been there for eight years now. It's an environmental advocacy organization. It's been around since the late 1960s and has its roots in banning DDT nationwide. And so EDF, like many of my colleagues who have already presented, is very actively engaged in the climate space and trying to find 
promising solutions to slow down warming now in addition to preventing long-term warming in the future. And so we focus primarily on methane specifically from oil and gas infrastructure. Um, but I just wanna note that I did my PhD on black carbon and I've attended the Montreal protocol meeting in the past to advocate for phasing out HFCs. So I'm, I'm generally in the short-lived climate pollutant world. And so I'm going to take a step back for a second and just re-emphasize some points that have already been made in the sense that many people don't realize that CO2 emissions are really only half of the climate change problem that we're, we're dealing with right now. Um, almost the other half is from short-lived climate pollutants and methane dominates the contribution from the short-lived climate pollutants. It accounts for around a quarter of the warming that we're experiencing today, both from it being a greenhouse gas directly, but also because it indirectly warms the climate by producing tropospheric ozone and stratospheric water vapor. Um, and so the main concern with CO2 and why we focus so much on it is because it builds up over time. So this amount of warming that we're experiencing today from CO2 is the result of 100 plus years of emitting CO2 into the atmosphere and it building up. On the other hand, the short-lived climate pollutants, the warming that we're experiencing today, which is around half the warming from the short-lived climate pollutants, is from emissions of these short-lived climate forcers over the past couple decades at most. And for black carbon, for example, it's just emissions from the past few weeks. So they're really powerful in terms of how efficient they are at trapping energy in the climate system when they haven't even been around for that long and they don't even last that long. And so if we want to stabilize our climate, we do have to get net emissions of CO2 down to zero so that they stop building up over time. And that's really important. But in the short term, the short-lived climate pollutants will really contribute more to warming than the CO2 emissions that we emit. Um, so an example of this is that when we look at all of today's emissions of methane from human activities, they'll have more of a warming impact over the next 10 years than all of our emissions of CO2 from fossil fuels right now. So that's a lot of warming that's just coming from methane that people don't realize when we focus so much on CO2. So CO2 really is this long-term challenge that we need to bring down, but pollutants like methane are really the key to slowing down warming now. And so this is because pollutants like methane are so powerful at trapping heat. So for example, even though we emit 100 times more CO2 from fossil fuels than we do methane every day, each pound of methane that we emit can warm the climate over 100 times more than the CO2 over the following 10 years. So that's why it contributes so much to warming. So what this means is that we really have a powerful opportunity to slow down the rate of warming in the coming decades, because these pollutants contribute a lot to warming right now, but they're gone so quickly, which means that they're no longer actively trapping additional heat. So for methane, which already contributes to around a quarter of today's warming and emissions are projected to double by the end of the century, we have a real opportunity to slow down warming right now. And this is at a scale that CO2 emissions reductions on their own can't do, which you've heard from my colleagues so far. So here's another way to visualize the impact. So the orange curve here is no action on any climate pollutants. The yellow curve here is our current NDCs, so not the revised ones that we expect to, um, to to come to an agreement on the end of this calendar year. And then the blue curve is net zero CO2 emissions by 2050, which is really important to stabilizing the climate in the long term. But you see here, if you don't act on the short-lived climate pollutants, we're still going to exceed the two degrees of warming that we don't want to exceed. And so when we account for all the other greenhouse gases as well, and we get to <coughs> net zero greenhouse gases by 2050, we can really bring this curve down, and especially if we act fast to reduce methane emissions. And we can start slowing down the rate of warming in the near term, in addition to just what's going to happen in the long term. And so this does not, these figure does not include black carbon emissions reductions, which would bring this warming curve down even more. 
But if we delay action on methane, for example, then we could still achieve our net zero by 2050 goals, but we have a completely different climate outcome over the next few decades. So, and this is, you know, similar to what my colleagues just showed. There's all these damages that we could avoid in the near term by acting now immediately to address short-lived climate pollutants. And so that's why we don't want to delay action or move too slowly. So just quickly looking at where the sources of methane are coming from globally, and it obviously is different for every region. For example, in California, livestock makes up at least half of all of methane emissions. But globally, agriculture accounts for a little bit more than a third of methane emissions. Energy use from fossil fuels accounts for around a third, and then waste management accounts for around 20% of emissions. And this is projected for 2030, but it's a very similar breakdown when you look at 2020. Um, Alyssa, so, Alyssa yes, if I could. Sure. Um, can we go back over those share portions so that we're clear about what share is in California and what share is global? Sure, so this, this figure that I'm showing right now is global. If we were to look at this for California, livestock would be half of the entire bar. And there's a couple different sources for green for methane emissions in California, but they're around 50 to 60% of California's methane emissions are coming from livestock. The second largest contribution to California's methane emissions is landfills. Globally, it's oil and gas, but in California, it's landfills at around, I think, maybe 30%. And then um, around 20, 10 to 20%, depending on the source, is from oil and gas. OK, thanks. Sure. So we have technologies globally and available to reduce these emissions considerably in each of the major sectors. And we think that we could reduce emissions by or in half within the next 10 years based on all the existing strategies. And this does not include, for example, changing our behaviors of what we eat. For example, these are reductions that come from agriculture from just changing our production methods and changing you know, different systems that already exist, but don't consider, for example, changing what we eat. If we were to change what we eat and drive down our, our meat intake, for example, we could see even more reductions. And so um, I'll just quickly go through some of the main solutions for each one of these buckets. So for agriculture, one of the most exciting developments in the past few years are cattle feed supplements, which is basically something that you feed the cows as they're taking in their other food and it suppresses some of the methane production in the cattle's gut. Um, we also can do selective breeding and so specifically try to breed the cattle so that they reduce methane emissions. We can convert manure to energy and we can um, change how we manage water in rice paddies and which is something really important, especially in those countries where they produce a lot of rice. And from the energy sector, leak detection and repair is really a main strategy to reduce emissions from the oil and gas supply chain. A lot of the leaks are coming from upstream production. It's leaked out when we're trying to extract the fossil fuels from underground. And so a big challenge is just identifying the leaks, but then once you identify the leaks, it can be very straightforward to reduce them. So then we also can reduce venting and flaring, which can be unnecessary, but back in the day when these systems were first created, we weren't thinking about the impacts on the climate. We can seal wells, we can flood um, coal mines. And of course, if we were to decarbonize society, that also would drive down methane from fossil fuel sources. And so finally, because I know the next speaker is going to go into waste, I'll just say very quickly that we also have uh, strategies to reduce emissions from landfills and wastewater. We can use it as an energy source. We can also do better at what, what waste ends up in the landfills. 
And then finally, just echoing the last speaker, there are so many different benefits beyond slowed warming to reducing methane emissions. We can have job creation. And because methane is a producer of tropospheric ozone, which has air quality effects, we can save thousands of lives globally and millions of tons of crops by just having improved air quality. So I will stop there and thank you all so much for your attention. So um, I, I have a I have a question um, about uh, the um, reduction of. Let me. I'm sorry. Let me, I'm looking at my notes to try to find this question. I was really interested in on the methane side. Um, generating this methane in our landfills and our wastewater treatment. A lot of that, and I know Kobe was going to get into this in more detail. A lot of that is already there. I mean, so if we do things like uh, divert organic waste from the landfills, which we really should do in the future, and we have this, um, this um, already generated methane in these, in these landfills, um, don't we have to capture it in some ways? Um, can we prevent it from becoming fugitive methane? or do we have to capture it and use it? Yeah, so there are in the US in particular, there's a lot of infrastructure already developed to basically suck landfill gases out by sort of this vacuum. And then there are different pipes that can divert the gases to facilities that can then turn it into a usable product for energy purposes. So yes, I mean, we, we do need to you do something with it or you know otherwise we're going to have to store it we want to prevent it from getting into the atmosphere um in the u.s i think we could we can be and I'll, and i'm interested to hear what my the next um speaker will say about this but i do think we can be more efficient with our gas capture from landfills because a lot of times i think we are um, capturing more of the gases after we've closed a landfill and a lot of the gases escape while the landfill is still open. And so I think there are opportunities to collect more from the landfills in the US, but certainly globally, there's a lot of opportunities just to install this infrastructure in places where it doesn't exist at all. And so that can really drive down emissions. You can, you, you asked me about landfills, but I'll also talk a little bit about manure. If you just cover a manure lagoon, it actually does prevent some of the gas from ever even escaping out of the manure because there's limited airspace between the manure and the cover. So the way the thermodynamics works is that it prevents some of the gas from even being produced and emitted. And so at a minimum, that's something you could do. But then yes, if you were to connect that to a digester and feed that manure into this basically tank that breaks down the manure and turns it into a usable energy product that's you know more efficient and can really drive down emissions. All right, so I have two questions that arise here and I hope Kobe is patient, okay, Kobe? Um, one is California adopted SB 1383 um, to create um, obligations um, on the part of state itself and perhaps others to reduce their methane, reduce all of the short-lived climate pollutants. Um, how are we doing with implementing 1383? Are we making the kind of progress it envisions? So I, I am from Washington, DC. I don't oh, I focus see. on California policy. So I'm sure some of my other colleagues on this call who are from the California area could better answer that question. I, I really can't. That's just not something that I focus on in my day to day. Okay, so Kobe is probably forced <laughs> to deal with it. So we'll ask yeah. him how, 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 that, how that's going. Listen, I wanna thank you so much for joining us, um, contributing to this discussion, helping to lift up the problem of short-lived climate pollutants. I love that when Increasingly, I think people should be getting the picture that uh, zero carbon ain't enough, right? We've got to go Definitely. beyond zero <laughs> and we got to deal with short-lived climate pollutants on a co-equal basis.
if we're going to uh, get to where we need to go. Thank you very much. Definitely, thank you. Toby, my friend, how are you? Good morning. Kobe, you're the Assistant Deputy Director at LA Department of Public Works, but you're their Enviro guy, am I right? I'm one of their Enviro guys, focusing particularly on uh, waste, and uh, I'm excited to be here. So you and I have had a, a conversations from um, time to time about, about how we do, how this is done. Our audience probably has never heard from a practitioner is actually dealing day to day with how one deals with methane in landfills. So uh, can you give a bit of a description about what's going on out there and, and how effective it's been? Sure, and I can't think enough, first of all, you, Denny, for organizing this session. I think it's such an important topic. And also all of the previous presenters that have covered a lot of the um, background that I think really makes my presentation more focused, um, particularly about why methane is so important to capture and um, put into productive use, and also the importance of flattening that climate curve by addressing these super pollutants. And so, I'll, so, I'll... so, so you agree then with the proposition that reducing methane or reducing organics into the landfill and the wastewater is not enough. We're going to have to capture and use what's there. Yes. And the good news is that a lot of the solutions that I'll talk about that are relevant to particularly organic waste like green waste and food waste can also be solutions in the agricultural sector and in other areas. And I think Alyssa made some points about the ability to capture some of the, the biosolids and materials from um, agriculture and, and from livestock and use that in digesters to create methane um, and capture it rather than having it emitted into the atmosphere. But I'll, I'll focus on, you mentioned Senate Bill 1383, that's a California law. Uh, I'll talk about what the goal of that bill really is and what it looks like on the ground. And then I'll uh, tie into how that looks, how that will hopefully look like in the next few years and how that could be a solution for us. I don't have any slides, so that way I can keep my talking points very brief. So Senate Bill 1383, that was a bill passed back in 2016 by Senator Ricardo Lara. He is now in statewide office. And it really was a bill addressing super pollutants and particularly methane and black carbon. One of the big solutions in the bill was to require a reduction of the organic waste sent to landfills in California by at least 75% by 2020. And also had other provisions there in there related to recovering edible food for human consumption. And we, we've already talked about why um, getting organic waste out of landfills is so important. As Alyssa mentioned, it is the second largest source of uh, super pollutant emissions in uh, California. And so it's very important for us to address. It certainly has applications for the agricultural sector as well. And so it can go even beyond um, just the, uh, the landfill sources. Um, what, that, what success will look like ideally is that we have a widespread implementation of organic waste collection throughout California. It requires cities and counties like Los Angeles County to implement new organic waste service for every resident, every business, every government agency all county facilities will now have an additional bin or utilize our, our current green waste bin to collect all of the organic waste that was previously sent to landfills. And the goal is essentially by requiring us to collect as much organic waste as we can that we reach at least at 75% goal on a statewide basis. And we also have some really great programs that we've already been implementing to recover edible food. Um, these are great win-win solutions that um, not only keeps that organic waste uh, out of the landfills, but helps to feed people that are food insecure. Um, so we love programs like that. They're very cost-effective and can be climate solutions as well. The, the other piece of this is, you know, once we collect that um, organic waste, we need to send it somewhere. 
And currently solution is to convert it to a, what's called renewable natural gas or biomethane. And that is a way to make sure we're capturing all of it and converting it to something that displaces typically fossil natural gas. It can be used as a transportation fuel. It can be used to make electricity. It can actually be used to create hydrogen if we wanted to blend hydrogen into the natural gas pipeline or use it um, for specific applications. But I think it's very important for us to incentivize the collection of methane in all of its forms so that we uh, address that other piece of the component, which is reducing leaks throughout the system. And a good way to do that is creating value for that methane, particularly renewable methane, and that way reducing um, the incentives for allowing leaks to continue to, to happen. Um, we're excited to see programs in LA County that have already in, uh, utilized existing infrastructure. So for example, we, we have companies that have invested in projects that collect organic waste, put it into anaerobic digestion systems, create renewable natural gas, as well as other gases, clean up that material, that gas into a pipeline quality standard, which is uh, take some cleaning and um, processing, uh, inject it into the natural gas pipeline and then use it in existing natural gas vehicles, which are near zero emissions and on a climate basis are actually a net carbon negative fuel. That's an incredible thing and, and something that we really need to focus on. If we're going to get to net zero, we can't eliminate all of our emissions. And so we need net negative solutions like renewable natural gas to help us to get there. Um, we also have um, projects where we're utilizing our existing wastewater treatment plants as a way to co-digest not just wastewater, but also organic um, food waste and other organic materials that are digestible to boost the production of biomethane, uh, capture it and, and eliminate it from going to landfills. And those have been very successful. What I really wanna highlight about these solutions is they're implementable today, they're incredibly cost-effective, and they're a great way for us to accelerate the transition to uh, ultimately zero um, net zero emissions on a, on a statewide basis. And I do see them as not just a, a short-term transition, but something that we'll need to continue to implement uh, indefinitely. The reason being is that we're gonna continue to have organic waste to manage. Um, whether it's food waste, biosolids, agricultural residue, um, there, uh, and even uh, managing our forests is going to create millions of tons of organic materials every year just in California. And we need to make sure that we manage that material in the most environmentally sensitive and, and climate um, oriented way. And that really is to make um, renewable energy or fuels from those materials and prevent them from either decomposing in the environment or being sent to landfills where they do ultimately create uh, methane emissions. Kobe, I have a question about that. Um, I read uh, a Lawrence Livermore lab uh, report. And believe me, I, I don't spend all of my time sitting around reading Lawrence Livermore lab reports, but I did this time. <laughs> and um, uh, it, it described the scenario whereby um, a way to fight wildfires would be to capture um, organic waste, biomass that is called in the forest, that's now in effect the, the kindling for, for our forest fires. That, that would be your large share of it be captured and turned into biofuel and almost immediately into hydrogen. Um, it seemed to me that the challenge then is how do you convey it? somewhere where it's useful. Um, they talked about a new hydrogen pipeline system. What's wrong with using the existing pipeline system? What do you think about that? I, I think that's a great opportunity. And to me, any existing infrastructure that we can leverage to accelerate the transition to a fully renewable and carbon negative economy, um, we should maximize that usage. And you know, we were talking earlier about um, diesel trucks and the importance of getting them off the road. You can get 
probably five to 10 near zero natural gas vehicles running on renewable natural gas, which is cost um, competitive and sometimes even cheaper than fossil gas today, um, and get those on the road um, much more quickly than um, fully battery electric trucks, which are um, certainly emerging in the marketplace, but much slower to be implemented and um, will take longer to fully transition. I would recommend that we have the same goals for fully electrifying our fleets, but that we greatly accelerate the use of near zero emissions technology today so that we can reduce these, again, very powerful short-lived climate pollutants today. The natural gas system is another perfect example. We can inject um, quite a, a significant volume of hydrogen and blend it with natural gas, reducing the emissions at all of the sources where that natural gas is used, including our existing um, power plants, make it more renewable um, and utilize that existing infrastructure. All right, so some people um, object to that um, idea because they think that we're, if we do that, we're just keeping alive the natural gas system longer than it should or something. Now, my question to them is always, so what about this next decade? Um, we're, we're told by the IPCC that this is a crucial decade. Um, I think we'd be ready to see a lot of money invested in accelerated deployment of, of battery electric everything, including trucks. Um, the question of how rapidly that can happen is an unanswered question. Uh, how, you got to ramp up the manufacturing, you got to spread the infrastructure, etc. Why is it that um, people, some people resist the idea of near zero RNG? It seems to be related to this concern about, well, your facility, your, your belonging the use of natural gas pipeline system. What do you say to that concern? I, I think it's important to acknowledge the concern about perpetuating legacy systems, but I do think it's a false dichotomy. In the same way that we have these arguments about the economy versus the environment, we need to do both. And to me, it's a question of what do we do in the short term and how do we continue to mandate a truly zero emission carbon, uh, uh, either carbon neutral or carbon negative future. And I think we can do the same things together. The two actually complement each other. If we were to transition the natural gas system to use a, a mandatory percentage of renewable gas at 20% renewable gas, the entire natural gas system could be carbon neutral. And we can achieve that at a fraction of the cost of requiring you know, every appliance in the state, every vehicle in the state to transition to electric in a much shorter time frame. So why wouldn't we do both? In, in other words, mandate that transition to renewable and natural gas on the pipeline and then continue the transition to, you know, whether it's phasing out the natural gas system or continuing to use it as a pipeline for only renewable gases, whether that's hydrogen, renewable biomethane, or some combination of those two. All right, so Kobe, you're a lucky guy. I'm going to give you authority over a billion dollars a year to invest in reducing short-lived climate pollutants. What's your prescription? What's, what's, what's your plan? Well, with my portion of that billion dollars, my focus would be on making sure that we're successful in implementing Senate Bill 1383. Um, the truth is, and it's something that we will have to address very quickly, we're under a mandate to start collecting all the organic waste January 1st of 2022. That is only a few short months away. If we're successful in educating our residents and businesses to put all their organic waste in the green waste bin or in a new organic waste only bin, we don't have enough places to take that organic waste today. We definitely will not have it January 1st, 2022. So it's a race for us to invest in enough infrastructure, composting, organic waste digestion, biomass conversion within the state ideally to manage the millions of tons of organic waste that we're sending to landfills today. And so I would 
spend that billion dollars by partnering with uh, any entities that want to build those facilities. And we know we have quite a few of them that want to do that. California isn't always a, the easiest place to build new technology and new facilities, but with incentives, we can make that happen and make sure that we're not you know, collecting that organic waste and then having to send it to landfills at the end of the day because there just simply isn't enough capacity to manage all that material. Well, we thank you again for your efforts and for your participation once again on one of Move LA's Zoom posiums. I think we're gonna shift now to uh, Ryan McCarthy. Um, and uh, Marissa, I think you have, Ryan is not here with us live today. Um, we have a recording of him. We interviewed him. Um, he was appointed by Governor Brown to be the science and technology advisor to the office of the chair of the Air Resources Board. Now, translated, that means Mary Nichols, our very own Los Angeles-based Mary Nichols. Um, and uh, so, Marissa, do we have uh, Ryan ready to go? Yes, it should be on screen. I guess it's me and Ryan, isn't it? Yes. All right, so start her up. So the public generally thinks that the big challenge of climate, climate change is, is really about carbon emissions. They scarcely know about super pollutants, but in your um, assessment of the challenge, how would these two categories of emissions kind of rank in terms of um, impact and priority for reducing for reductions? Uh, well, I, I would say they both rank number one. Um, I don't want to say it's either or, but certainly I don't want to say it's it's carbon dioxide uh, at the expense of, of short-lived climate pollutants either. Um, right, so so short-lived climate pollutants, you would say, are about co-equal with carbon? Uh, in terms of their impact, or I think we need to be focusing on them both now, right? And we have taken a, a very deliberate approach, at least here in California, and a successful one, um, to lay out a pathway to getting, you know, 100% clean energy in the electricity sector. We now have a roadmap for um, a transition to zero emission vehicles in the transportation sector. Uh, we need to increasingly focus on other sectors from a carbon dioxide standpoint as well. And that's something that I think will be a big focus of, of CARB's planning this year through the scoping plan. Um, but we also put in place, you know, sort of a similar deliberate framework for short-lived climate pollutants. And we absolutely need that. Um, I think we only need that uh, ever, ever more so now that, you know, climate change is quickly becoming a very present um, threat and no longer seen as a, you know, a, a 2100 issue and a multi-generation issue, but something that's affecting us now. So to the extent, um, you know, short-lived climate pollutants weren't already uh, critically important to address, I think they only become more important to address and really an opportunity to try to engage folks who are seeing the impacts of climate change today and really trying to quickly mitigate them uh, the best we can through action on short-lived climate pollutants, even while we address the longer term uh, broader issue uh, of CO2 in the atmosphere as well. All right, so the way I understand it now, two pollutants are primarily methane, or what's sometimes called fugitive methane, um, black carbon, and HFCs are the primary. Some people say ozone counts also, but I've not seen really any data about their strength and actual impact. But so methane, black carbon, and HFCs are the priorities in super pollutant. And why are they called super pollutant? Uh, well, they're, they're called super pollutants because um, they have a very potent outsized impact on um, global warming in the near term. Uh, and they also have important um, impacts on, on air pollution. So black carbon is a great example. It's a, a component of particulate matter, which is a carcinogenic uh, pollutant that costs millions of lives uh, globally every year. It sounds like diesel. I've heard that connected to diesel, right? It's diesel. Um, it's, it's burning, really. Um, uh, burning of anything, whether it's, you know, biomass or diesel. But diesel has that, that dark black soot and then a really high component of 
of black carbon as part of sort of the soup of pollution that is particulate matter. So methane, tell us quick, briefly about what's the problem with methane. So methane in California primarily comes from cows. More than half of our methane emissions come from either the way we manure, we manage manure um, or from uh, the cows themselves. But other important sources of methane emissions are landfills um, and uh, leaks from you know, oil and gas operations from natural gas pipelines um, uh, and really from anywhere where natural gas is used. Uh, the state has put in place a pretty deliberate framework to address each of these sectors and each of these sources of emissions. We have regulations on the oil and gas, uh, on oil and gas operators to reduce methane emissions. We have a set of rules um, and guidelines around pipeline management uh, to make sure that we're minimizing leaks from our pipelines. We have landfill regulations, and now we have um, organics diversion regulations to get organics out of the landfill altogether. Um, this is really an exciting effort and a, a leading effort that California is blazing a trail on, but um, we'll continue to take some work to implement and make sure we've done so successfully. Um, and then there's been a, a number of efforts related to the dairy industry um, and uh, that have been quite successful in getting some early projects going and some significant reductions from manure management, um, but that still need you know, some additional work to uh, reach the rest of the sector um, and to reach the enteric fermentation emissions, which are the emissions that come from uh, cow burps. Um, and you know, there's some promising solutions there or, or emerging solutions, but they need some more work, some demonstration uh, and then ultimately need to understand a framework to scale them. Oh, well, I mean, who'd have thunk it, right? Calbert. Yeah, it's, yeah. You know, it's <laughs> a threat to life on Earth. <laughs> you know, an existent, part of the existential threat. <laughs> I think that that's a, it's a fine how do you do. <laughs> so, um, uh, all right, now there was uh, legislation, I guess, uh, SB 1383, um, by uh, Senator Lara. Now, I guess he's our, what, our treasurer? Insurance commissioner. Insurance commissioner. Yeah. Uh, Senator Lara, sorry, I didn't mean to, to move you to another office already. Um, Senator Lara's legislation, AB, SB 1383, took a whack at trying to get things going in terms of addressing these concerns. Um, how well is that program being implemented? Are we making progress? I would say we are, but we can't we can't uh, let up, right? So as I mentioned, there is an overarching framework in place to address uh, many of these these sources. Um, I think a couple of things we can look to as as sort of uh, illustrative of where we are today is the organics piece, for example, um, 1383 set in statute. Uh, very stringent organic diversion goals and CalRecycle has put in place recently uh, regulation to achieve that. And now it's a matter of, of implementing it. And it's, there's a, you know, a conversation going on. Um, we need jurisdictions to work with project developers and haulers and everybody in the, in the ecosystem, all the stakeholders to make sure we successfully uh, implement this and get the projects developed that we need to on time. And I think we can, but it's a matter of, you know, working together and just committing to do so. Um, All right. So some people say, just to, again, for our audience, round out this, what the significance of this, some people say that these short-lived climate pollutants together are responsible for about 40% of our uh, climate change. Of our greenhouse, of our of our global warming, and they say because they are short lived, if we remove the new emissions from the atmosphere, we can make a big positive impact on climate. Is that is that, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think we can put some science to this, and whether it's forty percent or forty five percent, I'm sure Dr. Ramanathan or others on this panel could could pinpoint it for us. Uh, but it's a significant impact. And I think it's worth appreciating both as a, a need, but really an opportunity um, to, to say, hey, if we can you know, uh, come close to eliminating black carbon, if we can significantly reduce methane emissions, those are impacts that we can feel 
you know, immediately in the case of black carbon and, you know, within a decade in the case of methane, uh, that will uh, really help to slow the impacts that we're feeling right now, um, which quite frankly, I think, you know, many of the people uh, on this symposium would, uh, especially in California, where it's just 110 degrees in June, you know, will appreciate or are terrifying at this point. So. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity. Again, we need to address CO2, and, and that's the big, you know, long-term driver as well. We're beginning to do that, and there are other strategies that need to be discussed for that too. But you put them together, um, and you know, you can really help to slow things down to the extent we can, you know, immediately, even while we address the longer-term trajectory uh, and really the whole of the problem. All right, so here comes the dramatic question that the IPCC report back in 2018 put to us it was basically like we had till 2030 to get our act together, roughly. I'm sure, right? Um, on on this, and so if we were going to make a big impact in that shorter time frame, kind of sounds like what they're pointing to is really short-lived climate pollutant, and that's the thing that could have. A, a big impact in a short period of time, right? So imagine we had a boatload of money, like a billion dollars a year, to spend on reducing short-lived climate pollutants. One, that really have an impact? Two, what would we do? Yeah, so uh, yes, it would have a big impact, I would say. Um, you know, I, I want to we can't predicate our action on on the availability of a boatload of money, but we can uh, imagine how it uh, can accelerate action, how it can make action politically easier, uh, and how it can uh, allow us to really uh, imagine going further than we could. So, you know, the state's goals, exa for example, on methane are 40% reduction um, below 2013 levels by 2030, uh, which is significant. Um, and at the time was about as far as we thought we could push. It was also where the science was saying we needed to push. But with more money, you can dig deeper into uh, all the sectors and achieve some of the, the um, you know, less lower hanging fruit. Uh, you can dig deeper on things that are really social, um, uh, sort of not easy to target specific sectors and, and best practices, but are, are broader issues. Uh, and you can really go new and accelerate, you know, uh, research, development, and demonstration of things like enteric fermentation, where we can imagine and sort of see some solutions emerging, but they they still need some more work. So, imagining we had a load of money, a billion dollars a year over over 30 years, um, is it possible to imagine then that kind of investment? could roll back the emissions of short-lived climate pollutants sufficient to actually roll back climate change? Um, well, to roll back part of it, right? I, I do think we can uh, really get a handle on the short-lived climate pollutant piece. Um, you don't take them to zero in most cases, but you can take them you know, to zero or near zero in some applications and in others um, you know, to as low as you can get them. Um, but you can, you know, achieve significant reductions. And if there is uh, more money and more will, you can only get, you know, deeper reductions as part of that. Thank you very much, Ryan McCarthy. I hope you had a chance to look in. And uh, so, Carolyn. Hey, Kobe, how are you? We're going to move the discussion to Gerilyn Lopez Mendoza of the Climate Center in Santa Rosa, although you're the LA person, right? That's correct. All right, so takeaways. You've heard, we've heard this. Um, you've not been taking notes or what have you. What do you think are the big takeaways from this discussion? Well, I've been listening very intently, and I want to thank you again, you and your team, for bringing together this group um, to talk about the importance of short-lived climate pollutants. I think the biggest takeaway, and this is no surprise to anyone, is that we must move quickly. We have to move fast. Um, short-lived climate pollutants are called super pollutants for a reason. Um, I think it was emphasized by Ryan McCarthy that they are both potent climate pollutants as well as air pollutants. So there's a distinction there, 
Um, climate pollutants obviously cause damage um, in terms of uh, being greenhouse gas emissions. Air pollutants are uh, more prone to affect human health. And there's some back and forth there, um, but particularly with respect to um, black carbon or diesel soot um, as commonly known, we know that there are significant um, health problems that can result from long-term exposure to black carbon. So it can get into your lungs, it can affect um, your respiratory health, it can affect your neurological health, especially for children and the elderly. And when it comes to frontline communities and disadvantaged communities, um, in communities suffering from environmental injustices, the importance of getting uh, diesel um, trucks and other uh, equipment that run on diesel, particularly ships, as was mentioned earlier, um, it's important to get those out of communities as soon as possible. So uh, as it relates to um, the short-lived climate pollutants, it's really underscored over and over by all of the participants today that we need to move quickly. We need to move fast to reduce these pollutants in our atmosphere as soon as possible. Um, I also thought it was inspirational to hear from uh, Mr. Doniger about how we've done this before. We have been successful in banning things that we know are harmful to the environment with respect to um, the CFC ban in the 1980s that was damaging the ozone, um, that was protecting our climate um, for the world. And we were able to successfully ban that in the 1980s. So we have experience um, in getting harmful pollutants banned. It's happened before and we can be successful again. So in terms of the three main um, super pollutants we've talked about today, um, there was a robust discussion about methane and all the different sources of methane, naturally occurring methane from the agricultural sector, particularly from livestock and uh, manure, um, as well as food waste in landfills as discussed um, in detail by uh, Mr. Sky. Um, so those naturally occurring sources of methane um, it is possible to uh, capture them and perhaps clean them up and inject them into um, the natural gas existing pipelines as a form of renewable natural gas from naturally occurring sources. Um, but it does take time and it does, it does take some expense to get that to pipeline quality gas. Um, so that's something that must be considered when we talk about how to both capture the naturally occurring methane and then turn it into a source of natural gas that can be utilized um, in existing uh, natural gas vehicles and other uh, sources of, of uh, power. Um, we also talked about the oil and gas system leaks um, for methane, that um, those are still a contributing factor in California and across the country, and that may be um, a less expensive way to reduce methane exposure and methane release into the environment because that's a matter of very good and strong maintenance of existing um, gas infrastructure that's already out there. Uh, we also talked about in great detail, as I mentioned, the, the carbon issue, the black carbon issue, um, and uh, I think a lot of the folks who spoke today talked about the importance of eliminating diesel. Um, now, how we eliminate diesel, whether we continue on a path where we are utilizing uh, compressed natural gas, renewable natural gas, um, liquefied natural gas in existing um, uh, trucks and other large um, vehicles, buses and um, garbage trucks, for example, um, that's an open question because there, there are a lot of people who are concerned about continuing to perpetuate um, the natural gas system that is primarily focused on a fossil fuel. Some of it is, can be renewable, but it is essentially a fossil fuel. So does that mean that we can turn to electrification of engines? And um, I believe there's a gentleman from Climate Works who said that we're closer to the electrification of engines and trucks, heavy duty trucks, class eight trucks that um, move goods from the ports, for example, um, we're closer than we think to making those commercialized. And as was pointed out um, by our expert from EDF, um, having electrification 
of trucks and other heavy duty uses is better than um, hydrogen fuel cells because hydrogen can also be a super pollutant when it interacts with certain environmental factors. Um, so how we move away from diesel is an open question, but I think that um, the elimination of diesel has to be done quickly. It is again, something that affects um, disadvantaged communities disproportionately, uh, both close into poor areas, as well as near the warehouses in the San Bernardino um, and Riverside areas. Um, the other um, super pollutant we discussed in some detail were the hydro, hydrofluorocarbon, sorry, I, I stumble because I just usually say HFCs. Um, the thing that, that struck me about that discussion is the importance of replacing um, air conditioning um, infrastructure and, and, and air conditioning refrigerants in buildings. And this circles back to something we didn't get into a lot today, but what people have discussed a lot, which is how do we decarbonize buildings? How do we make buildings healthier so that they're, they're, um, they conserve energy and they use cleaner forms of energy, but they're also not polluting? And in this instance, the fact that HFCs are such a large part of um, the refrigeration and I'm sorry, air conditioning um, and uh, supermarkets have a lot of HFCs as it relates to refrigeration. Um, we do have existing buildings that are part of the problem that we need to be part of the solution. And we discussed um, at least one example, uh, Mr. Doniger discussed at least one example from a Chicago case study where they were able to reduce the amount of refrigerants um, used in old commercial buildings by 99.96%, which is extraordinary when we think about um, the kind of damage that the HFCs can do to our climate. So figuring out how to replace um, those HFCs to different types of refrigerants, um, both in the air conditioning, um, in existing buildings and new, newer buildings that are being built now, as well as the refrigerants that are used in supermarkets, I think is something that we need to make a priority. So I think those were the, the major takeaways from today. Um, we are faced with various challenges in terms of reducing the um, short-lived climate pollutants quickly and fast, but we also have a lot of solutions that are out there. And I think that's what was most illuminating today is that those solutions are there. And if we have the resources to bring to bear to all of these different areas, um, there are a lot of ways that we can reduce the super pollutants quickly and make uh, California a more climate safe place to be. Oh, th John, thank you so much. I, I, I have a couple of issues I'd like to discuss with you about it. Although I think one of the things that comes out of this for me is that the variety of activities that need to be engaged in effectively really do lend themselves to an investment strategy. Is having what I keep referring to as a boatload of money, like, like what a California-wide ballot measure might create, would really help accelerate all of this activity successfully. And so I come away with it thinking that um, that measure, that idea, that measure is really an imperative, preferably 2022, certainly by 2024. Um, that's one. But I have, but even if that were to happen, there is a couple of conundrums here that I see that I that I haven't yet found an answer to. And a lot of it turns around trucking. I mean, obviously the whole air pollution problem in the South Coast ultimately turns around trucking and getting off of diesel, right? And so there is some, some faith expressed that battery electric technology can do it. Um, and right, but it clearly is a question about whether it can do it in a decade. You know, can we accelerate that transformation as rapidly as that? Um, and then I think it was Kobe who said, We've got alternatives now that are able to um, replace diesel. So if this decade is so important, 
And, and if we can't be certain that the battery system um, can be done, uh, including all the charging networks, and frankly, it has to be national in nature, right? Because these are long haul trucks. They often don't know from one day to the next where they're going. They pick up in one place and deliver to another. They might get ordered, right? So uh, they really need a wide network of charging infrastructure. So it just seems like even if successful, being successful in a decade is a really heavy lift. So why not um, include these other, um, you know, like the RNG alternatives, the near zero, it's a renewable gas, it's not fossil gas, in the form of hydrogen, like in a fuel cell, why not that? Second question is, even if all the trucks then went battery electric, what do we do with the methane in landfills, wastewater, and dairies? Now, I can imagine that in landfills and dairies, we can use a lot of it for electric generation, maybe generation on site at the landfill um, and hooked into the, the grid. But is that possible in the dairy system? And wouldn't doing that create, in many ways, just what the folks who live out there don't want, a kind of rolling out of an industrial uh, infrastructure um, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, in what should otherwise be pasture land? So there's two conundrums here that it seems to me really revolve around trucking. How quickly can we get it done? And shouldn't we use renewable gas in the interim? And two, even if batteries can be successful, ultimately, what then do we do with the, with the biomethane in those sources? We have to deal with those. And so that's what I'm gonna wrestle with, with talk over with my friends and stuff and the, the big conundrum to solve going forward in my view. What do you think? So the issue you raise about the whole, um, it is a conundrum around trucks and how to quickly get rid of the diesel trucks that are predominantly on the road. I mean, we have 16 to 17,000 of them servicing the ports daily. Um, and it is a very um, challenging discussion to have because there are um, a certain um, set of environmental advocates who are dead set against the use of natural gas in any form, renewable or otherwise, uh, because they believe that it perpetuates the use of natural gas, um, which is ultimately a fossil fuel and a super pollutant um, as a source of, of uh, fuel. And they want to eliminate that completely. Um, on the other hand, as was pointed out, um, by Mr. Sky, there are CNG and LNG trucks on the road right now that dramatically reduce emissions as it relates to carbon. Um, and so they're, they are exponentially better than diesel trucks. Um, there's also folks who are, have and own and operate diesel trucks who believe that if they are able to capture those emissions either through filters um, or through other technologies, they can continue to use the diesel trucks on the road because they're able to clean them up to a certain extent to meet certain ARB and other EPA standards. So there really is a spectrum of, of choices, but I think the ultimate decision is um, whether or not we want to take, um, as was suggested by Mr. Sky, sort of a um, not one choice, but have many different options on the table so that depending on what kind of truck you have, you can choose the kind of fuel you want to put in it. And then it would be up to ARB or another entity to say, if you're going to drive a natural gas truck, it has to be renewable natural gas and then help figure out the market so that the market can put that renewable gas clean and in the pipeline for use in the trucks. Um, that being said, once it is ready, once the technology is ready with respect to batteries um, and they're able to reach the operational standards that are set forth by the trucking companies, then they can also be part of the market um, and there doesn't necessarily need to be a hard choice or a hard and fast choice by a certain date. It could be used what's the cleanest 
when it becomes available. So, um, so, so that suggestion sounds like, let's just imagine we have a measure of with money that a policy might be um, support all zero emission technologies as they develop, uh, prioritize that. But when there are certain applications, for example, or certain types of vehicles do not yet have that zero emission option, maybe there um, we support uh, the cleanest available renewable option. Yeah, that, that sounds like good language you could put in it right now. I hope we're recording this so you can come back to it. Um, the, I should note that just this month, there were funds released by ARB for um, people to use to incentivize the purchasing of electric vehicles um, in the commercial market. And the, fund, the funds were completely uh, subscribed and distributed within a couple of days. So there is an interest, there is a hunger, there is a want for those cleanest available battery operated um, uh, engines in the market. Folks want those clean engines. There, there is a delta between what is a what the costs are for diesel trucks, what the costs are for natural gas trucks, and what the costs are for battery trucks. But I think if given the choice, I think folks do want those cleanest possible trucks to be on the road, um, partly to be part of a larger solution for the state of California and partly for the health of their drivers. I mean, it depends if your driver's sitting behind a diesel truck all day with a diesel engine and breathing in the exhaust that they have to for many hours a day while they're working or a clean, a clean engine that runs on a battery that has zero emissions. I mean, that obviously says something about what kind of um, health that worker is gonna have or that um, owner operator of that truck. So I don't know that there needs to be a hard and fast rule um, about what technology to follow. I know a lot of folks who disagree with me on that point because they feel that if we make a choice about how we're going to move forward with the trucks, then we're making a choice that will take us um, decades in terms of infrastructure development. And that would slow us down and get into a zero emission a solution. So it really is a difficult conversation to have. And I think it's important to have it because the most important thing that we've learned today is that we have to move away from diesel as soon as possible. And then as it comes to, well, if we're not gonna use renewable um, biogas or natural gas um, in, in trucks, then how are we gonna use that methane that we capture and are able to clean up to uh, pipeline standards? And like you say, there are a lot of uses out there that it could be re reused in the pipeline. Um, so to the extent that natural gas continues to be used to generate electricity, renewable natural gas can be part of that solution. Um, but also the issue of using it on site. Um, I know that there have been um, several different um, um, companies that use the methane that occurs on site with respect to food waste, for example, and they are able to utilize that methane generated by the food waste that they are manuf not manufacturing or processing, um, and they're able to use it on site. And so they're able to clean it up and make it a source of electricity and get themselves off the grid. So I think that is a definite possibility. It's obviously being used in, um, in uh, a number of places around the state. I know there was a tomato farm that was using it. Uh, there's an onion farm that has used that. Uh -huh. um, whether or not it can be adapted for the dairy farms is a question because you need a certain amount of waste um, and a certain amount of livestock to be centered in one space to generate enough naturally occurring methane to make it cost effective to clean it up and use it on site. And when you do that, when you bring together that much waste and that much livestock, you might be creating a nuisance for neighbors um, in communities where the livestock are. So there's a, an interesting um, So, Gerilyn is frozen, I think. Good. So, that must be more done. Uh -huh. it, it could be more than that, but we have to be careful about creating a nuisance of smell 
and noise. And um, depending on if there's a pipeline that goes there, you'd have to truck that methane somewhere and then you're creating another problem. Right. Okay, so Jalen, thank you for your observations. Thank you to Climate Center for its partnership. We'll be continuing that partnership in many ways, I'm sure. Um, thank you to our audience for joining us. Um, we th I thought this was a very illuminating discussion and sharpened my understanding about what dilemmas are that has to be solved with a boatload of money. Thank you so much. Fortune favors the bold. Bye-bye.